Good afternoon and welcome to our third installment of Internet Infrastructure Issues. Today we're going to cover the economic geography of data centers. But first, a reminder. In 2014, there was a genuine debate about the emerging and increasing importance of the Internet in our daily lives. On one side, some argued that because the Internet was not called a utility, think about electricity, water, sewer, that it didn't need government regulation or support. The corporate world, it was said, would absorb the cost of building the millions of miles of wires and cables and launching the satellites while assuming the responsibility for connecting it directly to our homes. The other side argued loudly that the Internet should be treated like a utility, that by definition, a utility is an important service like water, electricity, or gas that's provided for everyone and that everyone pays for, and it deserves to be subsidized at some level and supported and regulated by federal, state, and local government. Today's May 20 of the year 2020, and we are in an incredibly connected but socially distant world. Today, we rely on our home connectivity for almost everything, work, school, family, friends, even food, and internet connectivity, driven by internet infrastructure issues, seems today more a necessity than a luxury. In our first two installments of internet infrastructure issues, we introduced some very practical suggestions for professionals that work in environmental health and safety and offered some free tools for understanding and managing clean water resources in an emerging data center industry, an industry that's increasingly focused on resiliency, on environmental responsibility, renewable energy, and sustainability. We were joined in those episodes by our good friends and environmental health and safety experts, Walter LeClaire from Digital Realty and Michael Labradovich, a noted clean water expert from NALCO. And if you missed those presentations, I invite you to go to our data center's webpage for a free download, and you can hear for yourselves some practical tips and pointers on environmental responsibility and sustainability. Now, we have guests on this webcast. Uh, we host it every other week. And in this webcast, we have guests, not sponsors. And from time to time, we introduce resources for your understanding of the complicated world of Internet infrastructure. Our guests today have some important resources you should know about. We'll provide details on those and how to get them in a minute. But before we get started, I wanted to introduce you to an Internet infrastructure resource called Interglobix. That's I-N-T-E-R-G-L-O-B-I-X. Interglobix provides global consultancy services to data centers, the subsea and terrestrial fiber companies with some of the biggest clients in the industry. And my personal favorite is the Interglobix magazine. Interglobix publishes a high-quality magazine that's a great tool to be used as a reference guide and has about 90% of the content written by actual leaders in the Internet infrastructure industry. It's really difficult to find magazines and publications that are solely focused on the Internet infrastructure industry, but Interglobix does just that. And I'm happy to say that in the anniversary issue upcoming, we will be featured with some exclusive legal content from McGuire Woods. You can find it at www.interglobix.com. Before we get started, I wanted to point out a feature that we have, and that's the opportunity to ask questions and answers. Uh, the questions can be posed by hitting the radio button at the bottom left-hand side of your screen, and we'll receive those questions and we'll, we'll answer them as we get to them. It really helps round out the presentation. We have attendees, hundreds from around the country, with us today who are thought leaders, who are professionals, and who are workers in the Internet infrastructure industry. In 2016, Northern Virginia overtook New York as the largest data center market. Virginia has a unique position in the Internet infrastructure market because as a result of some deliberate state and local policy decisions, Northern Virginia has grown to be the largest data center market in the world. However, the data center market is evolving rapidly as states and metropolitan regions around the country try to gain some momentum or maintain a market share of this lucrative market. There are new markets like Phoenix that have been pushed to the top 
while some more established markets, like Chicago, are attempting to remain competitive. Where are we and where are we headed with this increasingly dynamic industry? For answers to those questions, please join McGuire Woods Data Center's team alongside Mangum Economics to hear about the demand for a digital economy and an increase of data centers across the United States. Today we're joined by top data center economist Fletcher Mangum and David Zorn. Fletcher is the founder and CEO of Mangum Economics. He has over three decades of experience in quantitative analysis and policy development at both the state and federal levels. He was appointed by Virginia Governor Bob McDonald to serve on the Governor and General Assembly's Joint Advisory Board to Economists in 2010 and was reappointed to that position in 2014 to serve both sides of the aisle for Governor Terry McAuliffe and then again for Governor Ralph Northam. He's past president of the Virginia Association of Economists and serves on the board of the Virginia Council of Economic Education. He has also served as the associate director of the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia. He earned his PhD in economics from George Mason University in 1995, where he specializes in applying economic insights to public policy questions. Good afternoon, Fletcher. Good afternoon. Fletcher, we're joined by your colleague, David. David Zorn is a consultant with Mangum Economics and an adjunct professor at the Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Before that time, David was an economist at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, where he worked on issues of food safety, nutrition, bioterror vulnerability, drug importation, tobacco marketing, and quantitative risk analysis. He finished his time at the FDA as the Director of Social Sciences, and in that role, he led and oversaw resources on consumer responses to labeling and public health messaging and on economic effects of FDA policies. As a consultant, David works on issues like state and local economic development, regulatory policy, benefit cost analysis, data quality, and international regulatory cooperation. David Zorn earned his PhD in economics from George Mason University. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. As we look at a national data center's environment, um, where the data centers are located, and, and, and more importantly, where we think they will be located in the future, the question I'd like to talk about today with Fletcher and with David is, where are we now and where are we headed with this increasingly dynamic data center industry? Fletcher? Dale, thank you very much. Before we get into, we have a lot of good information for you today, but before we get into that, I thought I would take a moment for those who may not be familiar with Megam Economics to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Megam Economics is based in Richmond, Virginia, and was founded 17 years ago. We do work in several key areas. One of them, obviously, is data centers. Uh, to give you an idea of some of the more recent projects that we've done, this year alone, we worked for the Maryland Chamber of Commerce to do an analysis of what data center development might mean to Maryland, and that study was actually instrumental in legislation being passed just this month, uh, enacting Maryland's first data center incentive. We also completed our third uh, version of state analysis for the Northern Virginia Technology Council, the data center market in Virginia, and have been lucky to work with Josh Levy uh, throughout that process. Josh left MDTC not too long ago to found the Data Center Coalition is doing some really great work there. This year, again, we also worked on what data center development might mean for Michigan, and there we're fortunate enough to work with Steve Del Bianco at NetChoice. And last year, we did an analysis of the data center industry in Illinois uh, on behalf of the Illinois Chamber of Commerce, and that study was also instrumental in Illinois passing their first data center incentives since last summer. In addition to that, we do quite a bit of work in some cables to work with Mid-Atlantic Broadband Communities Corporation to initially convince Virginia Beach that the Maria and Brusa uh, high-speed subsea cables were a good idea. And then after that, working with NBC to look at what the economic development potential of that would be for their service area on an industry-by-industry -industry basis. I mean, what good recruitment targets would be. We do a lot of work in the renewable energy field. 
We have worked on 3.5 gigawatts of uh, solar power or done studies for 3.5 gigawatts of solar power. And including an inclusive of that was S Power's 500 megawatt facility in Spotsylvania County, which is the largest solar facility this side of the Rockies. We also were just recently hired by the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance to do an analysis of what Dominion Energy's $7 billion investment in offshore wind off Hampton Roads might mean to Hampton Roads, particularly if it kickstarts Hampton Roads into becoming a wind, offshore wind development hub for the East Coast. We also do quite a bit of work in regional local economic development. And as Dale pointed out, both David and I have a background in public choice economics which is the application of economics to government policy. So we do a lot of work and have throughout our careers in terms of analysis of tax policy, regulatory policy. Our presentation today is going to be two parts. Uh, I'm going to handle the first half of that, which is a very high level uh, profile of the data center industry in Virginia and what it means to Virginia. And I think one of the main points about the data center industry in Virginia is that it's big. Northern Virginia is the largest data center market in the world. Almost more data center inventory than the second through the fifth largest markets, which are in the United States, are Dallas, Silicon Valley, Chicago, and Phoenix. It's also important to realize that it's growing fast. 22% of data center capacity in Northern Virginia has been added since the second half of 2000 or between second half of 2018 and the first half of 2019. And again, as Dan pointed out, as Dale pointed out, Northern Virginia supplanted New York as the largest data center market as recently as 2018. Now that's an important aspect of that is that again it shows just how fast moving, dynamic, and competitive this market is. Because in 2015, New York was the largest data center market in the United States. Now they do not even rank in the top fifth. So this is a very fast-moving industry. This graphic shows you or gives you a comparison of data center markets within, northern, within North America. That very, very large blue dot on the right side of the United States is Northern Virginia. And I think that shows you graphically how large that market is relative to the rest of the country. The second largest market in the United States is Dallas-Fort Worth, followed by Silicon Valley, followed by Chicago, followed by Phoenix. If you compare those blue dots on the screen again, I think you can get a very good idea of what the size of the Northern Virginia market is relative to the rest of the country. This chart shows employment growth in Virginia within the data center market between 2001 and 2017. Over that period as a whole, employment growth was really not all that spectacular, 12.9% relative to 12.8% across all industries in the state. But if you look at the period from 2012 on, which is when data center incentives were enacted in Virginia, it's a very different story. Between 2012 and 2018, employment or growth in employment in the data center industry in Virginia was 36.1% relative to 8.9% across all industries in the Commonwealth. And you see a similar situation in terms of growth in data center pay. Data centers are a very capital intensive industry, which means that they have a lot of expensive blinky lights and, and capital investment, but hire a relatively few number of individuals. But because they're a capital intensive industry, that relatively few number of individuals are paid quite well. And what you see in these employment numbers or in the, um, the wage numbers is very similar growth to what we saw in terms of employment. Over the period as a whole, wage growth in, in this industry increased by 105.6% in Virginia relative to 58.4% across all industries. But it's also important to realize that there's, again, an inflection point there in 2012, which is when data center incentives were enacted within the state. Part of our analysis for Northern Virginia Technology Council was to look at the economic impact that the data center industry had on Virginia in 2018. And what that analysis showed was that it has a very large impact. Direct and indirect employment was 45,290 jobs. Included in that number is construction. And if anybody who's gone for a drive in Data Center Alley in Loudoun lately and seen the cranes that are something of a forest, you understand why that's a big number and a, a big part of the local uh, economy there, as well as in other portions of the state. $3.5 billion in pay and benefits. 
and $10.1 billion in overall economic output. So this is a big industry for Virginia, not only the largest data center market in the world, but also a very large economic fiscal impact on the state of Virginia. This chart looks at that fiscal impact. Now, again, data centers are very capital intensive, which means that they have a lot of very expensive blinky lights. And those blinky lights are subject to local taxation and state taxation. Data centers receive a sales tax exemption in Virginia on the purchase of that capital equipment. But capital equipment is subject to every other tax that's imposed upon on business personal property. And particularly for localities, it's a very large source of revenue. If you look at the state as a whole, state and local revenue from the data center industry in 2018 was $600 million. The largest portion of that was from Northern Virginia, $461 million in state and local revenue. The second largest, or the, the second largest sector or um, region within the state was Central Virginia, $37 million. Now, Central Virginia is going to grow, and the reason for that is twofold. One, we are strategically located or Central Virginia is strategically located halfway between the high-speed cable landings in Virginia Beach and the internet drain in Ashburn, Virginia. So it's very much a strategic ge geographical location. Uh, in addition, because of the QTS network access point here in Richmond, we are, Central Virginia is attracting a lot of activity and will continue to attract a lot of activity. So that number is going to grow. The third largest in terms of state and local revenue was Hampton Roads. Again, Location for the high speed subsea cable landings, Maria and Brusa, and soon to be Dunant, uh, they are $21.3 million in state and local revenue. So, a large source, particularly for local revenue, because of that large capital investment. The other aspect of being capital intensive is that a lot of money in terms of capital investment, not as many employees. But from a locality's perspective, what that means is a lot of revenue from capital equipment that can be taxed. At the same time, a relatively small drain on local services because for most localities, particularly in Virginia, the largest portion of their government services are K-12 through education. It typically accounts for over half of every locality's budget. Uh, data centers don't have a lot of employees. As a result, they don't really impose that much of a drain in terms of local services. You're able to get very detailed information from three localities in Virginia, Henrico, Loudoun, and Prince William County, and the revenue that those counties received from data centers, and we're able to take that information along with employment figures for those counties to look at what the likely cost in terms of services was. When we do that benefit to cost ratio, what we find is that the numbers are, are astronomical. When we look at Henrico County, 8.6 benefit to cost ratio, which means that data centers deliver $8.60 for every $1 that the cost the county in terms of local services. And again, that's a growing industry here. So when this analysis was done in 2018, most of the Facebook investment, $2 billion investment, had not uh, been occupied. So as a result, the blinky lights were not yet there, yet there to tax. But that number is going to change. When we look at more developed markets, in Louisa County, I'm sorry, in Loudoun County, a 15.1 benefit to cost ratio for every dollar that those data centers cost the locality in terms of local services that generate $15.10 in terms of local revenue. For Prince William County, 17.8 benefit to cost ratio, which means, again, for every dollar that those data centers generate in terms of local expenditures or service expenditures, they, they create $17.80 worth of taxes. One of the things that we looked at uh, as part of this is what, what would happen if the data centers weren't there? I mean, what would be the impact on those localities if the data centers weren't there? And what that analysis showed was that the biggest impact is they'd have to get that revenue to maintain the current level of county services. They'd have to get that revenue from someplace else. And property tax is the largest source of revenue for localities. So in all likelihood, that would mean an increase in the property tax rate. In, in Rico County, again, fairly under, or not quite developed market as of yet. As a result, that would inf that would require an increase in the personal in the uh, real estate property tax from 87 cents on $100 to 88 or 88.3 cents on $100. In Loudoun County, it's a very significant impact. Uh, property tax rate would have to go from a dollar and eight or dollar 8.5 cents per 100 to a dollar 31.3 cents per 100. Very significant jump. In 
Prince William County, the increase would be from a dollar or twelve point five cents to a dollar and twenty cents. When you look at the median housing price in those localities to ascertain what it would likely mean for the average household, what you find is that in Loudoun County, it would mean an increase in their local tax bill on an annual basis of approximately one thousand one hundred and twenty two dollars per year. So this single industry really depresses local tax rates to an extent that it allows that type of saving. And that also has a positive impact in terms of overall economic development, because it's also depressing tax rates not only for residential, but for businesses as well. Uh, when we look at Prince William, the same number is $277 per household per year. So very significant savings as a result of this industry. Again, the industry in Henrico is still developing, so as a result, the numbers there are not quite as impressive, but I'm sure they will be over time. At this point, I'm going to turn this over to David Zorn, my colleague, who is going to give you a little bit more information in terms of what overall trends look like nationally and what the implications of those trends are. David? Thank you very much. I'd like to just take you for a minute uh, back to this slide, this uh, of, uh, map of the continental United States. Um, that big blue circle on the uh, east coast that uh, represents northern Virginia didn't just happen organically. Uh, northern Virginia's place at the top of the data center market is a relatively recent development. Um, as recently as 2016, uh, northern Virginia supplanted New York uh, and the tri-state area uh, as the largest data center market in the United States. Um, in 2017, the tri-state area had fallen to the sixth largest data center market. Um, so things change rapidly um, in this industry. Uh, there, I, I found a report, a uh, commercial real estate report from 2011 on the data center market in the United States that in all of four pages contains one um, mention of Virginia and I will read that sentence to you now. Rest in Virginia has excess supply and new construction will be minimal for a few years. That was all in, in a four page report about uh, data, the data center market in the United States. That's all that uh, Northern Virginia was worth mentioning. Um, today, you could do an entire uh, report only on Northern Virginia and and uh, cover a whole lot of, of what goes on in data centers in the United States. Um, the reason that circumstances can change so quickly in this industry is that all that computer equipment is replaced on a three to five year cycle. So with companies replacing 20 to 33% of their equipment every year, they can easily reposition their operations in a fairly short amount of time. Um, they may not um, remove existing capacity uh, from one place to move it to another, but they just don't add to it and they just don't replace so that um, over a, you know, just in a, just in a few years, all their operations can move from one place to another, or uh, and as they increase capacity, the the, the share uh, in the new lo the preferred location can increase dramatically. So that's something that uh, is important to keep in mind as we we go through the rest of this presentation. One major reason for Virginia's success uh, is its data center tax incentive. Um, the Virginia sales and use tax exemption on computer and uh, the cooling equipment that's required to run the computer equipment is uh, available to facilities that employ 50 or more people at a wage of 50% uh, uh, higher than the local uh, uh, county average and also invest $150 million or more. Um, that's the incentive as fairly close to the way it was enacted in 2012. There was a there was a very much smaller, less attractive incentive 
that went back prior to that, but 2012 is really um, when you see the data center incentive of Virginia being uh, crafted so that it really made a difference to attract uh, data centers to the state. Um, in 2017, uh, in the fiscal year, 24 facilities qualified for that tax incentive. So it's important to keep this in mind that um, not all data centers in Virginia qualify for the incentive. Um, it, the incentive is actually one of the more restrictive incentives across all the states, and we'll look uh, in just a short time at, at how many states uh, have incentives. But it, this isn't just a blanket, if you are a data center, you don't have to uh, pay sales and use tax. In 2018, um, the estimate was, and this is, these are the most recent numbers, uh, available that $86 million would be exempted by uh, the sales and use tax exemption. And that's, 20, that's $86 million in potential state uh, sales and use tax. Um, that all raises uh, the question um, about, uh, you know, if, if there's that much potential tax revenue, um, being uh, exempted, is, is this worth it? Um, it's important to remember, and Fletcher mentioned, but it, I'll just say it again because it's, it's often um, forgotten, that the sales and use tax exemption incentive doesn't mean that data centers don't pay taxes in Virginia. Far from it. Um, and uh, so they pay uh, uh, employer withholding taxes, they pay corporate income taxes, they pay utility taxes at the state level, the local level, they pay real estate taxes, business property taxes, license fees, and industrial utilities taxes. Um, as, as one um, data center uh, executive once told me, I just, I just wrote a check to the state of Virginia to pay my taxes, and it really makes me unhappy when people say that I don't pay taxes in Virginia. Um, so there's a lot of state revenue that comes directly from data centers. Um, and it's also important to keep the context of what this incentive does uh, in mind. Virginia doesn't give any money to data centers to attract them to the state. There are no grants to data centers. Um, the state doesn't actually spend money, as a lot of times people talk about with an incentive, we're spending money on data centers. They just don't collect as much taxes as they otherwise would. That's what uh, the incentive does. In 2019, the uh, Virginia Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission um, did an evaluation of the uh, uh, data center tax incentive, <coughs> excuse me, um, to answer this question of, you know, what, what does it, what's the impact on state revenues of the incentive? Among them, there was quite a few major findings uh, of the, the report. We'll just look at a couple of them. The first one was that 90% of the investments that were made by companies that received the incentive would not have occurred within the state without the incentive. The, the investments in data centers would have happened in some other state. Um, this wasn't a conclusion based only on the uh, survey of data center executives, although that was one thing that they did, but also there is a whole liter economics literature um, that tr attempts to estimate how economic development incentives influence uh, site selection choices. And running that, that model, uh, that, um, the uh, Audit and Review Commission did, they come up with this 90% uh, effectiveness of the incentive. That's really remarkable. Um, if you've seen 
uh, a lot of studies on investment effectiveness. Uh, usually, it's not unusual to see percentages around, sing, you know, in the single digit area. Um, sometimes even less than 1%. So 90% is quite remarkable. Um, among uh, the uh, Audit and Review Commission's other major findings, if you, if you read all the way down to Appendix N of the evaluation report, um, you'll see that for every dollar of tax revenue that was exempted by the state in 2017, the state recovered $1.09 in state tax revenue. Uh, that was in 2017, fiscal year 2017 and 2016, the incentive was revenue neutral. And over the course of the period since the incentive's been overhauled in 2012, so uh, since the, the 2013 would have been the first fiscal year where you could see that effect, and you do see it in the data if you go back to all the way to 2010, but going back to 2013, the state of Virginia has recovered 75 cents of every dollar that's exempted. Um, so for 25 cents on every dollar, this state program creates, in addition, thousands of jobs, billions of dollars of pay and benefits for people in the state. Um, it's, uh, I, I haven't tried to, to do, uh, to compare to other line items in the state budget, but there's probably not a lot, if any, other uh, state uh, expenditures, if you want to use that term, that would return that kind of, of uh, get that kind of return. Um, it's important to, to mention here that the way we're estimating, or I, we didn't do this, <laughs> the Joint uh, Audit and Review Commission um, did this analysis, but the way it's done is to look at not only the revenue that data centers send in to the, to the state, but also the revenue that's generated by the people, the tax revenue that's collected from people that have jobs and have income because the data centers existed. And it's only, um, uh, uh, they're only counting the data centers, the 24 data centers that receive this incentive. This is actually a, a, a very important uh, finding um, that, that JLARC has made. And, and, and it does show that this is not just a, a a, a, a giant waste for the state. 33 states off, actively offer data center incentives in the United States. Virginia is by no means alone. Um, I say actively because North Dakota actually has an incentive. Um, it is limited to four participants and it's fully subscribed. It's been that way for quite some time. So even though North Dakota does have a data center incentive, you, you're, if you're thinking about citing a data center there now, you're not going to be eligible. Um, this map has a whole lot more blue uh, on it now uh, than it did just a few years ago when we first did this. Um, and it shows you that data centers have a lot of options when they're making site selection decisions. Um, if, if there's a state that really isn't interested in having data centers there, um, it, it's, it's, it's not a big pain um, to find some other place that probably offers very, very similar um, circumstances as far as fiber, as far as labor, as far as uh, energy costs far as water availability, all those things that matter for site selection. I just want to go through the, uh, a number of uh, recent additions to the map. Um, there is, as Fletcher mentioned, uh, the Illinois Chamber of Commerce um, hired us to do an analysis of the uh, 
data center market in Illinois uh, in 2019. Uh, the Chicago market has always been a, uh, a fairly large mar um, market uh, in the top five. Um, when, when we started that project in 2019, Chicago was ranked number three um, behind uh, Northern Virginia and Dallas. By the time we finished, um, the, the, the next ranking that came out put it at number four. Um, and that was the situation that they were seeing. Um, the Chicago market was not keeping up with the other major markets uh, that it was competing with, even though it was, it was and, and uh, had been a large data center market. Um, and outside the greater Chicago area, in the other parts of Illinois, there was no data center activity. And that's in contrast, just across the border in Iowa, you have a large number of rural data centers, um, hyperscale data centers that uh, the cloud companies have put there, um, household names um, with data centers there. So uh, there was just a very, um, uh, uh, non non competitive position um, with its neighbors in Indiana. One thing that was quite interesting while we were uh, it just begun the project, there was an announcement that uh, Indiana Data Center was planned just a few miles away from Chicago, just right across the border from Illinois in Indiana. Uh, the fiber would have easily run. Um, uh, right around that edge of the lake um, from Chicago to Indiana. You'd have all the advantages of uh, the, being in the Chicago area um, and serving that market, and you'd be able to take advantage of uh, Indiana's data center incentive. What we did was illustrate how a, a new large data center in rural Illinois could um, add jobs, wages, and local tax revenue for the state, attract data centers uh, to downstate, what's called, what they call downstate areas, so anywhere outside of the greater Chicago area. And the incentive was enacted um, in the summer of 2019. <clears throat> Excuse me. As soon as that happened, the, and as soon as the enactment of Illinois data center incentive, Indiana, um, uh, also revised its incentive um, to make it more attractive to large data centers um, and to make sure that that development that was, was going forward in, um, in that northern corner, northwest uh, corner of Indiana near Chicago would um, still be attractive to uh, data center development. Um, excuse me, and uh, to stay competitive with Illinois. In Idaho, uh, just recently, there's a new data center incentive um, that was enacted. Idaho um, hits all the, bo the boxes for site selection for data centers, cheap electricity, plentiful water resources, low cost of doing business. Um, the only thing it didn't have uh, was a uh, data center tax incentive. Uh, the uh, people were successful, tech industry, uh, they are aspiring tech industry there, was successful in getting a uh, data center incentive that has the potential to, to really induce some hyperscale development there that uh, the type that's very suitable for rural areas, um, like you see uh, in other parts of the country. Iowa is kind of the, the classic example that people use. Um, Maryland, uh, as Fletcher mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, hired us to do an analysis of the potential data center market in that state. Um, Maryland is kind of in a similar, the report they asked for us to do is very similar to the one in Illinois, and um, uh, Maryland's kind of in a similar position except that unlike um, Illinois that had Chicago as a major data center market. Maryland had 
no data center activity to speak of uh, currently. The state was in the position of um, uh, considering a new school funding uh, scheme that would have required a whole lot more um, county funding for public schools. Um, and lo local governments were saying, well, you know, that means we're having to put in a whole lot more money um, that, you know, it's not as though they had uh, uh, budgets that just had a lot of extra revenue laying around. They didn't know what to do with. Um, our report was able to show that a, a large data center locating in counties in Maryland could supply that uh, needed um, local tax revenue for the counties. The incentive just became law just a few days ago, May 7th, um, and uh, it was, it was uh, quite, quite an achievement for the state, and we were excited to be part of that. Michigan is currently debating revising their incentive. They have a very, very restrictive, limited uh, data center incentive. Currently, bills are, have been introduced to expand the existing uh, incentive. We provided uh, information to Net Choice to use um, in their advocacy for um, the uh, the bills the, um, the the plan is to, uh, the, uh, what's being attempted is to expand the, the incentive so that it would appeal to um, hyperscale data centers, cloud, cloud companies, the household names we're all familiar with. Um, Washington State is debating revising its incentive. Uh, the state has a history of um, uh, a kind of uh, ch uh, changing with the weather on whether they have a tax incentive or not. If you follow the trade literature on data, the data center industry, you can see the effect of uh, incentives play out in Washington. The state had a data center incentive that a court invalidated. The legislative nature reenacted it um, only a couple of years later to um, remove it. Then a short time after that, they enacted it again. Currently, the incentive in Washington um, is available only for investment in rural counties. And what you see, if you follow the, uh, the story in um, Data Center News, is that each time the incentive was invalidated or removed, data center projects that would otherwise have been planned for Washington had maybe been announced or that people sort of, you know, the whisper uh, on the street were in development, were put on hold. Um, the current incentive that's only available for rural areas has really had the effect of pushing co-location uh, data center development that's best suited for urban settings um, pushing it just across the border um, to uh, the area around Portland, Oregon, um, uh, just right across the river from uh, the state of Washington. Um, and the co-location development within the state has dramatically slowed down. Um, finally, um, New, New Jersey is debating a new incentive it's one of the states that have never had an incentive, but where there's been uh, data center development. You, you can see these quotes uh, from uh, Gil Sandlitz, a uh, data center uh, executive, where he says, you know, 20 years ago, New Jersey was leading the country, um, and we haven't moved the needle in 20 years. Um, New Jersey really was a, a, uh, a place for uh, data center development that was very natural. Uh, New York uh, needs to um, have high-speed uh, uh, trading with, um, you know, the uh, financial needs there. You have a lot of um, cables, uh, under subsea cables that come to the New York area. And New Jersey was the place for that. Um, but 
where did they lose out to, according to the Data Center Frontier report, um, Northern Virginia. Um, so the bill that they were looking at uh, putting in place in um, New Jersey was, was going to be modeled somewhat on the uh, incentive for the state of Virginia. Um, exactly how that plays out still to be seen. Um, in conclusion, um, Northern Virginia has become the world's largest data center market, um, and incentives were instrumental in making that happen. They have a big, the industry has a big incentive and <laughs> impact on Virginia, um, 45,000 jobs, almost $4 billion in pay and benefits, $10 billion in economic output, and over $600 million in state and local tax revenue. Um, they provide localities with a lot of revenue um, without putting a lot of burden on um, locals need for local services. And that helps to keep local taxes low, which helps to attract other businesses. So the incentive really um, has, uh, has that helpful. Um, I'll just remind you that the independent evaluation by uh, Virginia's uh, Joint Legislative uh, Audit and Review Committee um, concluded 90% of the incentive was effective uh, at uh, inducing investment within the state. In other words, it wouldn't have 90% of the investment wouldn't have happened otherwise. Only 10% of the uh, the facilities uh, that got incentives would have come to Virginia anyway. In 2017. The incentive, incentive generated more state tax revenues than exempted. Uh, most states compete to capture a, port, uh, a portion of the large economic and fiscal benefits. Um, so uh, this is uh, definitely an issue of where the incentives matter. Uh, the site selection people will tell you that you know one of the the screening criteria for data centers is, does the state have an, uh, an incentive? And if they don't, then they're just not on the list. It, would, it doesn't mean maybe that they wouldn't be a good place, but there are other places that are attractive where they can reduce their tax burden. Um, local governments are also competing for data center development. Um, and uh, as far as being sensitive to the fact that, uh, you know, they're they want people to uh, locate in their counties rather than across the border in another county. You see that going on within Virginia, where data, uh, where uh, local counties have reduced their uh, taxes on um, computer equipment in order to attract data centers. And um, that's our presentation. We're happy to take questions. Uh, David Fletcher, thank you very much. Um, a few questions from the listeners. <clears throat> in the um, Joint Legislative Audit and Review Report, the JLARC report, um, was there a consideration made of local property taxes, or was it simply a consideration of, of state taxes? The JLARC report only looks at state revenues, uh, there was, there, I think they mention, as I recall, and it's a very lengthy report, as I recall, they mention um, uh, local revenues, but but the, the charge that they received was to look at the impact on the state tax revenue. So, what type of personal property tax exemptions do you do you see or do you expect to see at the county or the city level? And and you could certainly talk about any jurisdiction in the United States, but what, what do you see at the local um, county and city level that really incentivizes uh, data centers and understanding that there's a difference between, say, a co-location data center that serves a particular set of local customers and those kind of uh, hyperscale data centers that can really uh, locate just about anywhere given certain 
uh, screening parameters, but what, what kind of personal property tax exemptions do you see? Most of the competition, at least in Virginia, that we've seen, is not really in terms of exemptions, but in terms of local rates uh, for personal property tax. And a lot of localities, or a large number of localities in Virginia, are now very actively competing. Uh, and again, the, the high-speed cable landings in Virginia Beach have put a lot of counties in play uh, as alternatives to developments taking place elsewhere in the state. So you're seeing counties reduce their personal property tax rate, not exemptions, but the personal property tax rate, specifically for data centers, to attract a larger number of data centers. Uh, and that's what I'm familiar with. In terms of, yes, I know you mentioned co-location versus enterprise. And the thing to keep in sure. mind is that and I'm not sure everybody on the call knows what a co-location versus an enterprise data center is. Uh, enterprise data center is an, a data center for Microsoft, basically, or for Amazon or Facebook that is dedicated entirely to one um, entity. Where a co-location data centers are more like an apartment complex. There is a real estate agent, basically, who owns a co-location center and then rents space out for data centers for local businesses. But the enterprise data centers are really more the target for uh, data center incentives, at least in Virginia. And they are the ones who are really, in some ways, more fleet of foot uh, in terms of, of uh, what they can do. Although I'm not sure that's entirely correct, because what happens is that even with a co-location facility, the, um, although it's largely local businesses, uh, and as a result, they're not quite as fleet of foot, it still has an impact there. That's a really good point, Fletcher. And and I think, too, when we look at the tax incentives that can be offered at the local, um, say, county, city, town level, they're immense. But as you correctly point out, David, and I've heard this said in economic development, when you're trying to attract business, especially industry, and, and this is really an industry, um, you compete with every country in the world. And once they've decided to locate in the U.S., then you compete with every state in the country. And then once they've decided to pick your state, then you compete with every locality. But it really does start at the federal and the state and the local level. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Barbara Comstock, um, our, our member of the House of Representatives from Virginia's 10th District, who uh, was instrumental in helping push through some of the state legislation and keep a real focus on this particular industry. Um, a couple of other questions. Uh, which other localities, other than, say, Loudoun County, do you see having that potential either nationally or within the Commonwealth of Virginia? And, and what are some of those key ingredients for a local county or a municipality to be successful in attracting data centers and associated Internet infrastructure investments? Well, Virginia, again, specifically, uh, Central Virginia is in a unique position for a variety of different reasons, as I mentioned before, in that they are strategically located between the cable landings in Virginia Beach and the Internet drain in Ashburn. So they have a big advantage there. Uh, the tax regime in Central Virginia is lower than it is in Northern Virginia. Uh, so, again, they are in a position, I mean, some, some uh some data center firms are going to have to be in Northern Virginia. There's, there's no choice about that, but that's not the case with everyone. And uh, Central Virginia in particular is in a very competitive place to begin to attract some of that development. And we already see that happening in terms of uh, the, the expansion of QTS, $2 billion investment from Facebook. So other localities within the state are attempting to get into the game. Uh, that's also true in the southeastern portion, the southeastern corner, uh, corner of Virginia. Uh, but it, it is really a matter of local business climate, and along with incentives and or the state incentives and the uh, local personal property tax rates being a big attractor for, for these entities. A specific question about that. Do you think, and, and I appreciate your mention of, of Central Virginia, that would be Richmond metropolitan area, Henrico, Chesterfield, Hanover County. I know we have some uh, federal, state, and local lawmakers from those areas on the call today. Um, but as Central Virginia com begins to compete, is there anything on the other side of the Potomac, the Anacostia, do you think that Maryland's new legislation will make it competitive to Northern Virginia? And what effect then uh, is the, the cost of other related metrics, like the cost of power, um, 
or is is Northern Virginia's lead simply insurmountable? What do you see coming for the rest of the country and the rest of the future relative to the biggest players? Well, David is probably better the one to answer that question, but I think that uh, what Maryland's data center incentive did was get them into the game. I mean, this is all about overall business climate, um, and there are other things that Maryland's going to have to do to get more fully into the game. But this this initiative very definitely got them into the game. Uh, and no, Northern Virginia's lead is not insurmountable. I mean, New York could have said could have thought the same thing in 2015. So it, this really is a very fluid market and a very competitive market and a very open market. Uh, so I think that states are in a position to um, attract this industry. And but it requires it's a broader package in terms of overall business climate and electricity costs, which are key or a, a very important part. Uh, data centers on average uh, buy about a $1 million a month in electricity, so that's a big thing for them, obviously. So these are all key ingredients, but you know, massaging those individual pieces are how states are in a position to compete, and we can see them very, very actively doing it. David, do you have anything to add to that? I, I think that's, that's absolutely correct. That, that uh, giant blue dot over northern Virginia is is a giant giant blue dot compared you know compared to uh, all the others so it's not going to be overtaken uh, uh, you know anytime soon but um, things can change faster than you think and that's the the scary part is that you know no one would have predicted I I mean I I remember. Um, hearing people say, you know, can you believe we're bigger than New York? Um, and that was just a few years ago. Um, even the people in Northern Virginia were astounded. Um, it, the, the amount of development that has happened, and there are other places um, where a lot of development is happening. Uh, you know, Phoenix, Dallas uh, are really um, very uh, a lot of uh, a lot of aggressive development going on there. Um, I suspect that you know there'll be a blue dot up around Portland um, in the not too distant future. Um, the Maryland situation is very interesting, and because it's new, it's it's a little hard to to think about. Um, clearly, Maryland has access to uh, a lot of the fiber that uh, up around Northern Virginia, um, it, it's, I, I, <laughs> there are people on the phone call, I, I, I've seen participants um, who, who know the answer better than I do, so it, it would probably be a mistake to go much too much further than that. Um, but well, uh, it's, the, the, it's good the, to know your limitations, is, is David. <laughs> yes. Do you see much happening? We've, we've gone north now in 95. Let's go south in 95 for just a minute. Do you see um, North Carolina in any way comparing uh, Raleigh, Charlotte um, area comparing to uh, Virginia in terms of competition for that blue dot? Yeah, absolutely. The, one of the unfortunate things about that map, and I'm glad that you have it up there uh, for people to look at now, um, is that this is the co-location market. Um, that's the only uh, metrics that are available. Um, that's why there's no big dot over Iowa it's, um, or Ohio um, or North Carolina. North Carolina has quite a few very large data centers um, from household name tech companies. Um, the co-location market there is smaller um, and it's mainly kind of shared between Charlotte and the Church Triangle area. Um, so North Carolina is definitely a player in the data center market. They just, uh, you know, there's not metrics because the companies that do the cloud and enterprise data centers keep that information private. There's no need for them to tell how much capacity they have available because it all belongs to them. Um, so you don't see North Carolina show up, but I, I'm sure that North Carolina is a, a major player uh, for data centers overall, and it's going to continue to be that. I would say, too, from an industry perspective, um, 
and I'd like to take an opportunity to promote uh, our data centers team for just a minute. Everywhere you see a blind, uh, one of those blue dots, you have a substantial presence from McGuire Woods and McGuire Woods Consulting. We're one of the uh, few Amlaw 50 firms with a fully dedicated data center team and committed to seeing the industry grow. Towards that end, I see two metrics that we haven't yet completely addressed. The one is the longevity of the tax incentive. We just saw a tax, a pretty heavy tax incentive withdrawn, for lack of a better word, we'll use that here, withdrawn in Prince William County. Do you see that? The longevity of the tax incentives, remember Maryland's is only 10 years, unless you invest, I think it's $250 million. So you've got the longevity of the tax incentive for predictability for business, but then you have, and this is worth noting, and we're gonna cover this in a future webinar, the cost of power. I don't have time to get to all of the cost of power questions today, but we will be hosting future webinars on environmental uh, sustainability and government uh, governance, as well as power. Because remember, in Loudoun County in 2019, just the county in one location in one state surpassed one gigawatt of power usage. So obviously, when you have the twin pillars of the cost of electricity, and the cost of uh, and the benefit of tax incentives, those are two metrics that have to be looked at. What do you think about that from an economic perspective? Those are certainly <laughs> those are certainly important. Um, the the incentive, the statewide incentives are are have gotten quite complicated to analyze. Um, oh, well, because almost all of them now have multiple tiers, um, different lengths of time that they're uh, available, or uh, it's really extremely complicated to to compare them, uh, the incentives across states. Um, but as you mentioned, um, and Washington State kind of demonstrates, when the incentive situation, when the tax situation is unstable, people can look elsewhere. There are so many opportunities now where, where uh, localities and states are, you know, not just welcoming, they are going out and seeking uh, uh, and, and, and saying we're available for a development. The, 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 the search is almost opposite of what people think of. That it's not necessarily the companies are looking for places so much as the places are looking for companies to come there. Um, and so, you know, certainly making your um, local tax incentives um, or local tax rates unstable is going to have an effect. Um, but, you know, the tax incentives, even though that's what we focused on here, they're just part of it. Um, the, the cost of, of power is a huge deal. It's the major uh, source of cost for the industry. So they're extremely sensitive to power costs, and, and that's just, that's always going to be true. And so changing the cost of power could really make a big difference for where they want to be. And I think David's exactly well, right. I mean, what we see in Washington State and other places is one of the key features of stability in terms of what the incentives are or what the overall tax regime is uh, and business climate is, because absent that, these facilities are not in a position to do long-term planning. And before you commit those kind of capital resources, that kind of capital investment to a locality, you really need to know the answers to those questions and be fairly certain that the, the regime that you're looking at is going to continue for a while. So that uncertainty, as it is in, in all markets, is a killer. And uh, and I'm told in a conversation with Josh Levy from Data Center Coalition this morning that Prince William is convening a work group to kind of look at that issue over the course of the summer. So I'm not sure exactly where they are or where they will be. Well, it is fair to say, uh, David Fletcher, that businesses thrive best in um, an environment of predictability and stability. And I think that um, it would it would certainly that that's certainly one to watch. We promised the listeners some resources. Can you direct us to your webpage? I know we can find the JLARC study. 
and your, uh, some of your studies, your economic studies with data centers. Could you direct us to your webpage, Fletcher? Absolutely. We are located at www.mangum, M-A-N-G-U-M, economic, all one word, dot com. So www.mangumeconomic.com. Again, this is third in a series. Our next presentation will be on June the 3rd. We look forward to having uh, you with us then. Remember, McGuire Woods is at the nerve center of the data exchange from the commencement of electronic data collection through storage and security. We provide guidance on best practices to companies across industries on how to manage the legal risks associated with data centers and collection. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you on June 3rd.